Thank you very much, Mauricio, for that uh, nice introduction. And um, thank you all for, for coming. And it's uh, uh, a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I was here eight years ago just talking about a, a wonderful conference that was here on Colombia, on the situation in Colombia. Um, and uh, I always love coming to the city and this university, so I appreciate the invitation of the center, and, uh, and it's a great opportunity to come and, and uh, share some thoughts with you about the uh, countries of the Andean region in South America. Uh, and since I'm with the Intermarcan dialogue and not the Intermarcan monologue, uh, I'm going to try to keep my comments uh, somewhat brief and would encourage and welcome uh, questions and hopefully we'll have a good uh, exchange. I'm going to do what a, a journalist once called sort of a run around the farm uh, and sort of deal with a number of issues that I see as particularly interesting in the region uh, related to the political situation uh, in the Andes. Let me just start with, I think, two uh, issues that characterize not only the Andean, the five Andean countries I'll talk about in a second, but uh, all of South America and perhaps even all of, of Latin America and the Caribbean um, that I think are uh, reflect today's reality. Uh, the first is that the social agenda is extremely important in every country. Uh, social inclusion is sort of the new uh, catchphrase that's being used in a lot of uh, different countries. Uh, in Peru, last week, uh, Ollanto Mala, the president of Peru, uh, just created a new ministry called Ministry of Social Development and Inclusion. Um, so this is very, very high on the agenda uh, everywhere. And the second uh, question that I think is uh, very important is a distancing of the region from the United States. This is particularly true in South America, but I would even suggest even in Latin America as a whole, Mexico, Central America, at least in political terms, if not in economic relations. Um, the United States simply doesn't have the role it once had, doesn't have the capacity, the influence uh, that it used to have to shape developments or have a big uh, effect. Uh, whether one calls this a change to the left or applies any ideological label, um, um, don't think that's very useful, but some people like to say this reflects a leftward movement or something. I don't think, think since this applies to almost all countries, <clears throat> I think the ideological question is not the most relevant one. But these are two fundamental, I think, um, two fundamental facts. And just to illustrate this, one has to, starting with Colombia, we were just, talk, we were just chatting before, uh, Colombia is a country um, that has received more uh, aid assistance from the United States than any country uh, outside the Middle East and, and besides uh, Afghanistan and, and, uh, and Iraq, uh, almost $8 billion since Plan Columbia started uh, over a decade ago. Uh, just a couple years ago, very, very tied to the United States, free trade agreement signed, uh, negotiated in 2006, approved by the Colombian Congress in 2007, uh, just approved by the U.S. Congress and just signed by President Obama in Washington. Um, and yet, um, there's a sense that Colombia is pursuing a much more of an independent foreign policy than it had before. It's no longer as tied to the United States. And there's a sense that Colombia's priorities, it's not against the United States. I think the trade agreement is welcome. Um, this is an opportunity. It's an option that Colombians, like other governments, will want to take advantage of. There's a big market in the United States. There are investments that go to Colombia. But the fact is that there are other priorities. And there are other priorities in Colombia's in, in South America and other priorities in other parts of the world. Uh, and if you look at what Colombia is doing, the priorities when the new government of Santos came in uh, in August of 2010 was to try to um, reduce tensions with two of its neighbors, Venezuela and uh, Ecuador, to try to deepen ties with uh, Brazil, um, to try to um, 
to develop stronger relationships with China and other parts of Asia. Uh, these, are, these were the central foreign policy priorities of this new government. This was a very important shift from the previous government of Alvaro Uribe, uh, who is somebody who's a government that really came to Washington very frequently to sort of talk about the free trade agreement, to talk about greater aid and greater support from the United States. This is gone. And Colombian officials that now come to Washington uh, talk about innovation, they talk about education, they talk about energy cooperation, and it really just doesn't uh, have occupy the same place as it did before. So even a country <coughs> that was a major uh, sort of uh, uh, beneficiary of cooperation, and still is, um, there's some ha about $500 million a year that Colombia still receives. Even in Colombia, trade agreement is not seen as a sign of a very, very close relationship. There is a kind of moving away. Um, Colombia uh, pursued a non-permanent seat on the uh, UN Security Council. It is seeking membership in the APEC. It's seeking membership in the OECD countries. Um, so this is, I think, a very, very revealing uh, development. Santos himself, I think, is the ultimate uh, pragmatist. He's not doing this for any ideological reason. It's certainly uh, nothing uh, uh, critical of the United States. He's doing it primarily because uh, the world has changed. Uh, there are new opportunities, new markets, and he is, uh, thinks that it makes sense for Colombia's interests. Or, uh, Santos himself was the Minister of Defense uh, under the previous government of Alvaro Uribe. Uh, Uribe himself was a very uh, unusual politician, more of a dissident, a populist, uh, didn't have high regard for political institutions, parties, much preferred direct contact uh, with people. He had his consejos comunitarios uh, regularly. Um, Santos is a much more of an institutional uh, figure, more of a consensus builder, less polarizing, less confrontational uh, than Uribe uh, was. Um, but even what's interesting in Colombia is that even in a, in a country uh, where um, the president had, uh, had uh, did not support a strong institutions, uh, when it came time uh, for the court to decide on his third term in office, uh, the decision was made on February 26, 2010, that the Constitutional Court said that he was not entitled to run for a third term. And uh, there was little question that uh, once that decision was made that, uh, that Uribe would adhere to uh, the ruling, uh, which itself, I think, is a measure of some degree of uh, adherence to the rule of law and democratic traditions uh, in Colombia. Uh, ironically enough, if you ask the question, uh, what's the opposition today in Colombia? It's probably Uribe and Uribe's. Uh, so it's the former president and, and sort of uh, somebody who had picked Santos as uh, his minister of defense, was close to Santos. Uh, and now um, there's strong criticism about some of the decisions Santos is making on foreign policy, getting close to to Chavez, working with closely with Chavez in Venezuela is something that Uribe uh, doesn't support. Um, some of the legislation that's been carried out, uh, the, lay, uh, the law of, of protecting victims of violence, uh, the law that returns uh, land to people that had been forcibly removed from, uh, these are kind of measures that would not have taken place and did not take place during Uribe's eight years. So there is a, a shift not only in style, uh, but in substance uh, as well. The concern that Uribe is, that there is in Colombia uh, are several fold. One is the uh, security situation, which is Uribe's greatest legacy, uh, which has improved uh, over the last 10 years. But still, there's some signs of backsliding. Uh, there are criminal groups. The drug trade is still strong. Uh, the FARC, uh, it's still the only country with, a, with an ongoing armed conflict. The FARC still has capacity and is changing its strategy. Uh, and the government is uh, concerned about the security situation. And they've, uh, the Minister of Defense resigned. There's a new Minister of Defense. And this is an area uh, that, uh, that Santos has to watch very carefully. The second is the social issue. 
uh, Colombia, uh, for all of its progress and growth, uh, remains uh, one of the most unequal countries in Latin America, uh, has a high rate of poverty, and um, this has to be uh, a higher priority for the Santos government uh, moving, uh, moving forward. Um, but clearly, this is, I think Colombia is, is an extremely uh, interesting and promising situation. And uh, in terms of reform agenda and in terms of uh, uh, trying to establish some sort of social democratic uh, government, and Santos has kind of returned to his, more of his social democratic roots uh, as president um, after he made uh, somewhat of a detour, I think, with his, his time with, with, uh, with uh, Uribe. Just moving to Venezuela uh, and Chavez, I think there's nobody who uh, deserves more credit uh, than Chavez does for putting his finger on a real, the legitimate grievance that many Venezuelans and Latin Americans feel about social injustice and uh, inequality. And uh, I think if one talks about his legacy, that's what his legacy, uh, my, my guess, uh, will be. Um, I think that uh, he has tried to uh, fashion a different kind of order in, in Venezuela, uh, but the results have not been very positive. Uh, after 13 years uh, in power, uh, the two key problems, the real soft spots in Venezuela, are the economy um, and crime. Uh, the economy in and Venezuela has a very high inflation rate, about 25%, 30%. Um, and uh, oil production is, is way down. There are shortages of basic goods. Um, this is not a country that has performed well economically. And the crime and insecurity situation is also extremely serious. Uh, if one looks at Latin American data on Latin American countries, uh, crime is a problem uh, in almost every country. And if you look at some of the polls, on what's the top concern of most Latin American citizens, crime is, is usually at the top. In Venezuela, uh, the figures are really quite dramatic. When Chavez came in, there were 5,000 homicides a year. Uh, last year, there were something like 17, 18,000 homicides. Uh, Caracas is a very, very violent city. A lot of cities have become more violent, but I think Venezuela more so than others, and this is a, a critical issue. Uh, Chavez has not created an alternative <coughs> capacity, a government that really functions well. Even some of his social projects, his so-called missions that have been the innovation of, of Chavez's social policy, uh, face real problems in terms of their uh, implementing and carrying out their programs and, uh, and are, uh, are in real trouble. Um, he does have a different idea about democracy. This is a, Chavez represents a, uh, not a liberal representative democracy uh, where one talks about checks and balances and separation of powers, but it's a different kind of democracy uh, that for him sort of emphasizes social justice and he embodies the, the will of the people. He is, has been elected. Uh, he's defeated three candidates uh, already and uh, faces elections uh, next October, October 7th, 2012. Um, so he is legitimate. He does have the electoral uh, support, and, uh, but he has uh, concentrated power to a tremendous degree, and he really is the one who makes all the key decisions on all the issues related to the economy and, every, and just the operation uh, of the country. And his discovery of his cancer illness in June, I think, exposed that uh, the one-man rule that Venezuela has relied on. Um, there was a sense that, you know, all of a sudden the question was raised, what, hap what if something happens to Hugo Chavez? What will happen to this country? And it was clear that there was nobody else. There's a vice president, but there was, that was not really considered very seriously as an alternative, uh, that there was really nobody else who had been groomed who was really in a place to be a successor of Chavez, which is just highlighted in, uh, just the fact that he, is, uh, he runs the show. And this is not a country that over the, the decade or more that he's been in office has really developed any kind of institutions for succession. And this sort of uh, is associated with this strongman 
uh, uh, rule that has characterized him. Now, he does retain uh, support, and in fact, his numbers have gone up recently. Uh, it's about 55 percent uh, approve of Chavez. Partly his illness, I think, has, there's, there's a sort of a sympathy, compassion uh, factor there um, as well. Uh, he is somebody who is very, very effective in, uh, uh, in portraying the opposition as sort of the old discredited political order. You don't want to go back to that. You may not be happy with crime. You may have shortages, uh, but at least I care. Uh, and he has an ability to connect with a lot of uh, Venezuelans who still have faith in him. So he still retains uh, a lot of support. Um, but there's going to be an election, and uh, there, uh, the opposition uh, is perhaps in a better position than it's been in recent years. The opposition has not been very uh, uh, politically competent. Uh, it's made a lot of bad decisions, including boycotting elections, which had been very, very uh, negative uh, for them. And they've decided now to participate in the 2012 elections. They're having primaries in February uh, 12th of uh, next year to decide who's going to be the candidate. And they are promising to unify around the candidate that they pick uh, to challenge uh, Chavez. Um, they have a chance. Uh, there's a big debate among um, a lot of people, uh, analysts, of whether uh, there's even any chance, whether even if they defeated Chavez, whether they would give up power. There's a, a line of argument that says basically that there are a lot of entrenched interests in Venezuela. Uh, the drug trade has become uh, more important in Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela clearly has close ties to Cuba. There are some reports that Cuba gets about five billion dollars a year in subsidies in Venezuela, it's, uh, from Venezuela, that strikes me as a little bit high, but it's still a very substantial part of the Cuban economy. Uh, and there are those that maintain that there's just too much at stake for, uh, for them to sort of to see any change in government. Uh, there are others, myself included, that say, well, you know, these things are, uh, it's clear that um, Chavez controls the institutions, that there's not a level playing field, but there's still uh, a possibility uh, of some sort of change uh, in government. Um, there are three candidates now uh, in the opposition uh, that are well positioned. There are two current governors, um, and uh, Enrique Capriles is one of them. Pa Pablo Perez is another one. And then there's Leopoldo Lopez, who, is, who you may have heard of. He was the former mayor uh, of a district in Venezuela. Uh, and he recently won a ruling by the Inter-American Human Rights Court he had been banned from running, and the court ruled that he could run. Then the Supreme Court in Venezuela said that he couldn't run. He couldn't serve, but he could run. And so there's sort of an ambiguity about that uh, ruling. But he is very determined and resolute and uh, will run in the primary. And uh, although it's not clear whether he'll win, uh, and even if he wins, it's not clear whether he'll able, be able to serve. So we have this sort of ambiguous situation uh, in Venezuela. I think it's fair to say that Chavez's influence has declined regionally. Uh, about four or five years ago uh, was maybe the height of his, of his influence, uh, developing regional coalitions and alliances uh, that had a lot more strength. Part of the problem is that internally he has just become a lot weaker. Uh, the problems are a lot more serious in Venezuela. Uh, and with them, with political troubles, and now, of course, compounded by his illness, I think it makes it very difficult for him to exert much regional uh, leadership. Now, plus, you have actors like Juan Manuel Santos, who, who I think does have aspires to play a more active role in the region. So Chavez does not have the position uh, that he once had four or five years ago. Um, the United States is, has no, very little relations with Venezuela, and there's no ambassador. Venezuela. There's no Venezuelan ambassador in Washington. Um, there's very little communication, very little cooperation. Uh, uh, the United States has made a lot of mistakes in its dealings with Venezuela, including how it dealt with the coup in 2000, April of 2002. Uh, but it really is, I think, at this point, sort of standing back and watching, trying to figure out uh, <coughs> what may happen uh, in Venezuela, uh, what would happen in Venezuela without Chavez, who would succeed him. Uh, looking at some of the jockeying for positions and some of the internal 
uh, the internal battles within Chavismo itself and looking at uh, his brother and the foreign minister and the vice president and other players uh, who might be likely to sort of play a role in a post-Chavez uh, Venezuela. Uh, the main story, I think, in Venezuela is the sense of a lost opportunity. This was a country that uh, had a president who was elected in 1998 with uh, really a message that resonated a lot with Venezuelans and with many people in Latin America on the social question and great communication uh, skills uh, and a lot of money. Uh, when he was elected president, uh, the oil was at <clears throat> $9 a barrel. Um, it's gone up a little bit uh, since then. He's had a lot of resources to spend. So uh, that's an opportunity when you have money and you have a message uh, that puts you in a position um, to really to try to do something, to accomplish something. And I think the fundamental problem is just the model of governance of of just that he makes the, all of decisions is not something that works very well uh, and produces results, and I think we see that uh, in Venezuela. Just moving on to Bolivia, um, what's happening in Bolivia is also uh, very, very interesting. There, uh, like Venezuela, you had the collapse of political parties and a Evo Morales who comes in uh, as president um, and to, elected in 2005, uh, first indigenous president in a country where the majority of the population is indigenous. Uh, again, representing a major historic opportunity uh, and a change in the old order. A new constitution following what Venezuela did in 1999, uh, Morales does in 2009. Um, undertakes some social programs, um, tries to increase participation of indigenous uh, population, um, and, but recently has encountered some real problems. Uh, one of the problems was that uh, he uh, eliminated subsidies for on, uh, on uh, gasoline at the end of last year, and uh, the price went up 70%. And uh, a lot of people were affected by that in Bolivia, and it produced a very, very strong uh, reaction against the uh, Morales government. If you saw his approval ratings went from uh, over 50 percent to about 30 percent, 35 percent. So there was a tremendous drop. And uh, he uh, experienced what a lot of presidents do when they try to take those kind of drastic measures, and the prices go up by that amount uh, in, that, uh, in that time. Uh, and then more recently, he has confronted some, uh, some reaction from his own movement, from the indigenous movement, um, by a protest of what's called uh, TIPNIS, uh, a, a highway, a $450 million uh, highway in the Amazon that's funded by, by Brazil, uh, which has created some real problems and protests, uh, and there's been some repression by the police of the indigenous uh, movement. And uh, this is something that, we're, that, that Morales comes out of, uh, and yet it's, uh, he has uh, uh, wanted to pursue this path of development, how to balance development and environmental concerns is an issue that every leader sort of is dealing with. And he, he decided to go ahead with this, and yet it produced a very, very strong protest. Uh, so much so that he's really backed off on this project recently because uh, there was a concern that there was su such a strong reaction that his government uh, was in trouble. And so he's decided not to go uh, ahead with this, um, with this project, but it really illustrates the dilemmas that, uh, that Morales faces. Uh, how to combine, uh, you know, the indigenous communities want development, uh, want economic growth, uh, but they also uh, want to protect the environment, protect their territory, and so this was uh, a project that Morales thought would be accepted, but it really he miscalculated on that, and so he's pulled back. Um, also, uh, he obviously has a very bad relationship with the United States. There's no ambassador in, in La Paz, and there's no Bolivian ambassador in Washington either, um, and uh, Brazil is a major, major uh, influence, uh, increasingly so in Bolivia, uh, both because of uh, economic develop, uh, development as well as also the drug issue. Most of the, the, the coca that's grown in Bolivia 
uh, goes to Brazil uh, or goes to Europe, and it's not something where the United States uh, really has a major role. And recently there was a major uh, policy initiative and framework that was developed between Brazil and Bolivia on the drug issue. So Brazil is a very, very critical actor uh, in the Bolivian uh, situation. And so Morales, of course, rejected uh, the hegemony of the United States. And uh, Brazil wanted this project. And so those are the options that he's facing. But uh, this presents, has presented some very serious internal political problems for him. So he's pulled off on that. Again, there's very little opposition. Uh, we have these situations where presidents are in trouble, uh, there are difficulties, the kind of uh, revolutionary kind of goals and aspirations haven't uh, worked out very well, 21st, 21st century socialism is in trouble, and yet um, there's still uh, support uh, because they do represent a constituency and because the oppositions are so weak. And in Bolivia as well, uh, there have been three sets of oppositions. One is the traditional political parties that have been now completely uh, out of the scene, are not relevant at all. Then there were local governors, uh, particularly in the eastern part of the country, that posed a real challenge to Morales. Uh, they have also weakened and are not very uh, significant players. And currently, and this is the way it will play out, you have people that are, are split from Morales himself, from his MAS party, which is the party that, that, that Morales has. Uh, the former mayor of La Paz, Juan Guarnado, is one of those figures. And there are others that have become disillusioned and have split off. And that is really where the, politi the politics are being played out. Uh, in Bolivia uh, today, uh, not so much with the traditional parties, but with people that were formerly with Morales, but that have split off away from him. Um, Re-election is, uh, elections are up in 2014. He would have to get an amendment through the Constitution in order to be able to run again. Uh, and whether that will happen or not, we'll see. Uh, I think there's a lot of speculation that it is, but he's going to have to try to regain, recover some of the support uh, and enthusiasm from his own base and constituency that he's lost over these uh, recent protests. As a result of these protests, there were elections two weeks ago for judges, uh, which is part of the new constitution that judges would be elected. And um, the problem was that because of the discontent, <coughs> uh, about 45% of the votes were, were void or spoiled votes. Uh, which was a protest vote uh, for the way that he, uh, that Morales had dealt with these uh, mobilizations against the uh, the highway. So he is he is at a he's facing difficulties, but there's nobody, uh, no other option out there that has a lot of traction uh, at this point. Um, as I said, the U.S. is not really a relevant factor. There there are discussions about. Uh, uh, about perhaps uh, an ambassador going back at some point and some aid and cooperation, but Brazil is a much more much more relevant in the future scenarios in, uh, in Bolivia. Um, moving quickly to Ecuador, I Rafael Correa is very different than uh, very different background. He has a PhD from economics from the University of Illinois, as um, probably many of you know. Uh, but he also is a beneficiary of the implosion of political parties in Ecuador, uh, which took place when he was elected in 2006, came in in 2007. Uh, again, uh, what's a pattern in a number of these countries and societies is uh, political institutions that became discredited, bankrupt, uh, very, very uh, disconnected from their bases, their constituencies, and figures that emerge that, that take advantage of that. And Correa is somebody who's um, an excellent communicator uh, and somebody who taps into, has tapped into very effectively uh, a lot of that frustration uh, and discontent. The question there, again, is whether he's constructing uh, an alternative that's really viable uh, and that really is uh, laying the, the foundation for something, uh, for anything, any kind of long-term long sustainable uh, model and there, I think there are major major questions. Um, the has something called the alliance, the Alianza País, which is his party. But if you look look at that party, it really is a real 
uh, hodgepodge, a heterogeneous uh, grouping uh, that are joined together because of their allegiance to him. Uh, there's very little sort of coherence in terms of the uh, in terms of the politics, in terms of the ideology or programs or policies within within his movement. Um, he still re he still is clearly the most most popular political figure uh, in Venice, in, uh, in Ecuador. Um, there are major concerns that many people have about uh, some uh, anti-democratic uh, measures. Most recently, uh, there was a referendum that took place in May, uh, and there were two areas. One is on press freedom, and the other one was on the control of the judiciary, uh, which have created a lot of uh, criticism. I've drawn a lot of criticism from uh, international human rights groups, Human Rights Watch, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, the uh, Special Rapporteur for Freedom of the Press at the, Internet, at the Organization of American States. Uh, there is, uh, on, especially on press freedom issues, Ecuador uh, has been very, very problematic and very troubling. Uh, there are these laws on the books that are called desacato laws or, or insult slander laws. Um, and um, in most countries, uh, they're not really uh, they're not really applied in Venezuela in, in Ecuador uh, for criticisms uh, that have been made of Correa. He has used those laws to go against uh, columnists and others uh, that have been critical of him. So there's been very low tolerance on that, and many of the people who track uh, closely the issue of press freedom and freedom of expression are extremely concerned and worried about the issue in Ecuador, uh, perhaps even more so than Venezuela in some sense. Um, so there is a democracy question there as well as uh, his control, uh, moves to control the judicial system uh, as well. But there again, in, Ven in, in Ecuador there's very little uh, opposition to, uh, to, to Correa. Uh, the traditional parties are very weak. There are some new movements that have tried to uh, get some traction, but they also uh, really don't pose any serious challenge to him. And so he still, despite problems, uh, is still the most uh, popular politician uh, in, uh, in, in Ecuador. And um, he will be up for a re-election in, two, in 2013. Um, there again, in Ecuador, there's no ambassador, U.S. ambassador, or uh, or Ecuadorian ambassador in Washington, although they've been named, uh, which is a step forward, but they haven't yet been put in place. And, um, and the U.S. ambassador uh, uh, who's been designated hasn't been approved yet uh, by the Congress, but uh, at least there is a, a desire or intention on the part of both governments to resume, uh, to have an ambassador or a presence in both countries. Um, there is no uh, interest in having a free trade agreement between the United States and Ecuador, no interest on the part of the Ecuadorians. This is not something that's ever been, uh, ever been on their agenda. Uh, but they do have uh, interest in having preferences uh, to, uh, for products to, for the, to the U.S. market. Um, so they are interested in trade preferences, uh, although not a trade agreement like the one that was signed with uh, Colombia, or the one that would, that the U.S. has with Peru, for example, this is not of something that's interest. But they do uh, they do want the trade preferences for products to to enter the U.S. market. Um, let me just go finally to the Peru situation, which is also, I think, extremely interesting. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Yanto Mala is somebody who has come in, uh, put a lot of emphasis on the social uh, agenda, the social inclusion. Um, he, Peru is this tremendous paradox, a country that has grown uh, tremendously, very high rates of growth, and yet at the same time high levels of political discontent. Uh, poverty has gone down a lot, even inequality has gone down somewhat, but the population don't trust politicians, don't trust political, it's a country without political parties virtually. Um, and so there are a lot of contradictions and a lot of paradoxes in the Peruvian case. Umala, who ran in 2006 uh, in Peru uh, as somebody who was, a, who was an admirer and follower of Chavez, uh, distanced himself in this election. Uh, and he tapped into a real frustration among Peruvians 
who uh, may be uh, improving um, their economic situation, their economic conditions, and consuming a lot more, but at the same time uh, feel that uh, there's a lot of corruption, uh, there's a lot of crime uh, in Peru. Uh, these are the issues of great concern. And the distribution of, uh, of the fruits of development were not as, 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 were not as fairly distributed as they, as they ought to be. And um, so people didn't want to upend the system, but they wanted, they wanted uh, this kind of change. And the question is, will he be able to deliver? Um, some of the press characterized this, I think, incorrectly when he came to offices. You know, will he be another Hugo Chavez or another Lula da Silva? Which, you know, I think it's clear, I don't think he'll be either one of them. Uh, I think probably the more relevant comparison, at least from my perspective, is to say, you know, will he be, uh, how will he compare with other Peruvian presidents, with Garcia, who preceded him, and Alejandro Toledo, who was president from before Garcia. Um, and um, I think on economic policy, the signs are that he's continued a very, very orthodox uh, economic policy, has the same economic team that Alan Garcia has. There's no change on that. Um, he's trying to, and this is a difference with Garcia, to try to put emphasis on the social question. Uh, whether he'll be able to do that is something that I think is going to be a fundamental issue to watch in Peru um, because the state is very weak. Historically, it's been very weak, and whether it has the capacity um, that it's had in Brazil or Chile or other countries really to produce social uh, benefits and to have effective social programs is going to be in, in poor areas that have been excluded and very marginal in Peru, uh, where there's a heavy indigenous population, is going to be a real challenge for Wamala. I think the intention is there, but the ability to deliver uh, is unclear. And at the same time, he's going to have to continue uh, foreign investment. There's a lot of mining and other foreign investment that's going into Peru. And how to balance that uh, issue with the social agenda, I think, is going to be uh, a major problem, um, a major challenge. Apart from the economic and social, there are issues uh, about corruption, crime. Uh, Peru is now the biggest producer of cocaine, uh, surpassed Colombia. Um, Shining Path is not what it was before, but Shining Path still exists, particularly in the coca growing regions of Colombia. Um, there are security questions, uh, coca growing regions of Peru. There are security questions in, in Peru that will have to be dealt with. Uh, Umala himself is a former military uh, official and uh, lieutenant colonel, and uh, two of his key cabinet members are former military as well, the Minister of the Interior and the Minister of Defense. And so uh, on those kind of security issues is something I think that bears uh, watching uh, as well in the case of Peru. But this, there's great interest in Peru because of uh, Umala and because in the case of Garcia and the case of Toledo, you had high economic growth but very little change on the social side. And so uh, analysts said these were the missed opportunities. And the question is whether Umala will be able to take advantage uh, of this opportunity, assuming that growth continues, uh, but yet uh, whether be able to sort of deliver to a lot of Peruvians that have been outside uh, of the system. So this would be a tremendous test uh, for Umala uh, moving forward in a country where there are very few institutions that work well, including political parties. He himself doesn't really have a political party to speak of. Uh, the opposition in Peru is probably Fujimori, who was the Keiko Fujimori, the daughter of the Alberto Fujimori, who's serving a 25-year prison sentence in Peru for corruption and human rights charges. Uh, her party is probably the leader of the opposition, but again, it's not much of a political party to speak of uh, either, but she probably represents the opposition uh, at that point. But he has about 63, 64% um, support. He just is completing his first 100 days in office, and, uh, and uh, so we'll see what happens uh, with uh, Umala. Uh, as I mentioned to some people, the prime minister was in, was in Washington this morning. We had an event at my organization uh, with him. There's tremendous interest uh, in Washington. He was meeting with Hillary Clinton uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock. Uh, he had met with uh, Obama uh, as president-elect in Peru before he assumed office, which was 
is unusual. Uh, usually president-elects from Latin America don't, don't, don't meet with the president, but I think there's a, there's a desire to see Peru succeed and to see Umbala succeed. Uh, and so there's goodwill, uh, there's goodwill uh, toward, towards Peru. So uh, just, to, just to wrap it up, I think that you know, we're seeing an extremely interesting landscape uh, in the Andes and that's changing uh, very, very rapidly. Um, I think some of the experiments in what's using a shorthand neoliberalism, uh, sort of economic policies, didn't work very well. Uh, parties became discredited. There were alternatives, experiments that emerged in a number of countries. Uh, but I think the evidence is, is, is not very uh, positive that there is this alternative that's being constructed and uh, in places like Venezuela and Bolivia and Ecuador uh, that are moving in a direction that are viable and sustainable. Uh, I think the more interesting cases now today are Colombia, uh, for sure, and to some extent perhaps Peru, uh, although I think it's going to be very, very hard in Peru. I just think the, the, the history of state weakness and incapacity of the state is very, very difficult. Colombia. Uh, also faces challenges. It still has an armed conflict, uh, and there are limits to how far Colombia can go, despite all of the very uh, ambitious reforms that the government is pursuing in the context of an armed conflict. Uh, and security, while it's improved, uh, still remains uh, a problem. Uh, but I think it's in, in the context of the Andes, I think Colombia and Peru are the, the two countries to, to, to watch closely uh, as we move forward. So why don't I leave it there and uh, would welcome any uh, comments and questions. Thank you. Can you tell us how many countries of, from the left have changed the constitution so the president can be re-elected for it or, or limited for re-election? Well, there have been a lot of different cases. Uh, I mean, there's re-election and then there's, you know, I mean, in Peru they had re-election, but then they changed it back because of Fujimori. And so now you have to wait a term in Peru. Uh, and of course, um, uh, you know, there's, you know, Venezuela is, is the extreme case where there's indefinite re-election. And that's been, that was approved by a referendum that Chavez put up uh, for a vote. Um, in Brazil, they have re-election, both, they didn't have re-election until Cardoso was president and he changed that and now there's re-election and he was re-elected and Lula was re-elected. Um, so there's one re-election, there's one re-election. Uh, in Argentina, um, we just had a president who was re-elected um, and so uh, that was changed during the Menem years. Uh, in Chile, this is not, a, not an issue. It's not, there's no consecutive re-election. Uh, Michelle Bachelet could come back as, as, as president uh, after a period. Um, so it really is a, uh, there's a variety of, you know, I think if you go through, there are different sort of formulas and well, different arrangements. Right Only Venezuela, unlimited re-election. And that was, that was approved in a referendum. You put it up for a vote and, and so he can be re-elected indefinitely. Korea also plan to, to not unlimited. Right? right now, it just has another. He has another re-election, but he's not trying. He has an and in, in, in Korea. He's not. He's not. He's not. As far as I know, not putting up indefinite re-election in in Ecuador. And Morales, for him to be run again, he has to ch still has to change. Has to have an amend, amend the constitution. Uh, right now, he can't run in 2014, but the sort of the sense is that he's going to try to try to do that, assuming that he has political backing to do that. And there have been others that the other presidents that have tried and that have have failed to do this. Uh, Panama, Martinelli, and Panama, and uh, and uh, and others. Uh, uh, Dominican Republic has, has Leonel Fernandez is now in his third term, two consecutive terms, and then another term. So uh, it clearly is a, you know, it, it is, a, is a trend, and the argument is that this is, you know, that it gives you content, you know, that it's hard to, 
to have the, one of the criticisms in Latin America is that you don't have continuity of policies and this enables you to have continuity. That was Cardoso's argument. That was Uribe's argument when he changed the constitution in, uh, in Colombia, that we're in a war and uh, he compared himself to Roosevelt who was, you know, uh, elected four times and uh, said, you know, when, you, when you're facing a crisis, um, it's, you know, you need, you, you need to have time to deal with it. And so that was the argument that was used. But then obviously there's, a, there's the other side of it that it really sort of creates uh, reliance on one person and really, really has a very damaging effect on, on institutions. Yes. Um, just, just a quick one on that. I wasn't sure if it was Honduras or El Salvador that they had a, the wife who was trying to change the constitution so she could be elected. Like they did. Guatemala. Guatemala. Guatemala, yeah. When they got divorced. divorced. Okay, yeah, yeah, they got divorced so she yeah. could run. But, it, but then the Supreme that, Court said no. Okay. Didn't allow her to run. All right. I wanted to ask you about Argentina and if you think uh, now that Christina's re elected and her husband kind of passed away, um, she's kind of at a crossroads where she could go with the economy, um, as she was doing before with lying about the inflation, or covering up the inflation, you know, a lot of social programs that are going to be difficult to make um, in the future, commodities that they have. Well, I, you know, I think she's, um, she's clearly, you know, on a high now, and she's sort of found the winning formula. I mean, she's won by the historic vote, and um, I don't, I don't, I don't see anticipate any significant change uh, and adjustment. And uh, I think you're right that you know the sort of the the real there are problems there, and whether this is and the big question on Argentina is whether this is sustainable. I mean, a lot of countries would love to grow at eight percent, and and a lot of presidents would like to win the first round with fifty three percent. I mean, it's you know it's great, uh, but and if Argentina can do this for you know fifty years, I would be you know I, I would say well we think we found our model, but uh, I think as you sort of suggest, um, you know this is there are real there are real problems there. Uh, there's you know there's tremendous capital flight. There's no foreign investment. Uh, inflation, as you suggested, is not the official nine percent. Um, and uh, you have to, and it doesn't, it doesn't exactly uh, build a lot of confidence when, when those kind of basic data about how an economy is functioning are not, are not credible. So there are real problems there, you know, in addition to other, other problems and political problems and the like. But, but clearly, you know, if, uh, if, you know, you, you, you have these kind of electoral results and you have an economy that's growing. Uh, as a, as Argentina it is, it's 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 it, you know you're not there aren't major incentives to make changes, so uh, and some people think they can continue like this. Other people think they're gonna they're gonna have what they call a hard landing, uh, which Argentina has had in the past. Yes, um, I appreciate uh, that from the beginning of your talk, you tried to give some perspective in terms of the shift uh, in. The world, which means that the U.S. is less of a player in these events, and then you focused on the particularities of each country. I wonder if you have an assessment of this, the, the global shift. Um, in the midst of the world economic crisis, the word has been to some of us that, oh, that Latin America has been doing relatively well. Uh, you might point to cover-ups and, and false faces that are put on in different countries, as in the case of Argentina. But what's, what's, what is your assessment of that, and how has that affected some of these uh, particular governments? And in that context, too, is uh, you, you talk about the, the failure of development of um, so, uh, uh, economic development in Venezuela, for example. Uh, has the ALBA uh, project had any success, and how does that link up to this, this question of maybe relations with China, Iran, and, and elsewhere? Well, uh, on the first, I think that um, you know, the, sort of when you go to conferences now on Latin America, you know, sort of the joke is, not a joke, but sort of the, uh, people always start with the story of, you know, how Latin American uh, ministers always used to go to conferences and, 
you know, in the 80s and the 90s and sort of, you know, people, and people from the United States and Europe would say, you know, you started the crisis and you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Now the tables have turned and they walk in, ministers walk in and just sort of feeling pretty confident and just saying, you know, saying to the Europeans and to the U.S., boy, you really mismanaged your economy and uh, look at ours and we have surpluses and we're, you know, have fiscal discipline and we're doing well. And uh, maybe they get a little carried away with, with that. And you know, some people say there's a com there's a complacency on the part of Latin America because they see, you know, the rest of the world. I remember in the crisis in 2008. Um, you know, we had lots of conferences, and everybody uh, that I know got it completely wrong. You know, they thought that this was have a tremendously negative impact on Latin America. Uh, and if you look at Brazil, look at other countries, they weathered the crisis extremely well. And all of the predictions were wrong, you know, by a, a lot of economists who one would think would, would, you know, would be a little bit more accurate. So now I think the situation, there is some nervousness in Latin America. I mean, clearly if, you know, if, if uh, Europe, whatever happens in Europe and the United States, these are major markets. China now is, you know, is showing some signs. If something happens, I mean, China is the, largest trading partner of, uh, of Brazil, uh, of Chile, of Peru. It's a major trading, the largest trading partner of Peru is not the United States, it's, it's China. So what happens in China has a, tr you know, could have a tremendous impact on these countries. And I think there is a sort of a, a nervousness and basically the sense that a lot of, if you look at a lot of the growth projections in Latin America, people are, you know, saying, you know, they're going to be lower than expected. I don't think anybody's predicting sort of the crisis or collapse of Latin America because of what's happening in the global economy. But some of the more optimistic projections, I think, are, 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 are coming down a little bit. They're a little bit more modest, a little more moderate uh, than they were before because there is going to be an impact. But 2008, I think a lot of the predictions didn't turn out to be correct. Now, ALBA is, is you know, is really Venezuela. I mean, Venezuela is, I mean, ALBA is a, is, is a coalition that was started by Chavez and it has eight or nine members of, of, of ALBA. Uh, but, you know, to the extent if, if Venezuela is not in the same economic position as it was in 2005 or 2006 when ALBA started. And so when you have resources uh, and you're in a stronger economic position, you could be more effective as building these alliances. Uh, the, you know, China's involved, but China's involved everywhere. You know, it's not, it's not more, I mean, they're very involved in Brazil, they're investing in Peru, they're, you know, Colombia, they're, they're all, over the, all over the region. It's not just Venezuela. Um, there's no special relationship with Venezuela. Uh, you know, they're, they have pragmatic economic considerations that they apply to whatever country in Latin America, and that's how they operate. Iran, I think, is more of a geopolitical Alliance more than anything else, and Iran is, you know, is is clearly an ally of of of, uh, of Venezuela, as was Libya, the Gaddafi. Uh, there's no question about that, but that's an ideological question and uh, sort of uh, how they deal with the United States. Um, but I don't think there's a major economic. You know, uh, for, I'm not a specialist on Iran, but my sense is that Iran is not a very, it's not in a great position economically to give a big boost to Venezuela, Venezuela's economy. So Alba is kind of, is is in trouble because it's because Venezuela is in trouble, and Chavez is preoccupied uh, with his health and with his political survival, as I think he, you know, is facing. He's going to face. Uh, the, the, the major challenge that he's faced so far in, in 2012. Now he's, you know, he thinks he's going to win, and, and he may win. He's got support. I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all. But, but that's what he's kind of focused on. And some of these sort of larger, grandiose ambitions, uh, I think, have been scaled down, scaled back a little bit right now. Yes. What do you think these uh, relationships with China and Russia? Um, in terms of not just their economic relationships, but also the military relationships, what do these hold, do you think, for U.S. security? Well, I think, I think I, you know, I, the military relationships with China are very, um, they're really, uh, you know, so far at least, there's really, there's very little basis for any kind of concern. It's per, it re, and, and the Chinese are very, if you talk to the Chinese, they're extremely uh, sensitive about that. And, and very emphatic that this, these are, they're interested in the trade, 
investment is increasing. Uh, there are some military to military contacts, but nothing uh, that would uh, you know, create any kind of concern, certainly for the United States. And China's priority is having new relations with the United States. The last thing they would want is for them to do anything in the security area that, that would create difficulties in their relationship with the United States. So they're pretty careful about, about that. Uh, now, whether that continues that way or not, as they become more involved and have a greater presence in Latin America, whether their role expands beyond the economic and commercial and investment to more security, political, we'll see. But so far, there are very few signs of that happening, and they seem to be very conscious in trying to limit that, their role. In terms of Russia, Russia is a major, I mean, Chavez has bought a lot of weapons from Russia. And the people that are most concerned about that are, and we have my friend here from Colombia, uh, but I'll say it, uh, are the Colombians, at least the Colombians that I speak to. Uh, because the, you know, if the, if the weapons are, uh, fall into the hands of, you know, they're, still, they're still the FARC, and if the, if the weapons that are, that are purchased in Colombia, I mean by Venezuela, <coughs> fall into the hands of the FARC, the FARC is still, an insurgency that wants to overthrow the Colombian government. And uh, it doesn't really represent a threat to the United States. Now, when there are relation, when relations with Russia are bad in the United States, remember the crisis in Georgia a couple of years ago, and then there were some naval ex exercises in the Caribbean that the Russians had, and there was sort of, you know, then, then it becomes much more of concern, the relationship with Venezuela, because Venezuela is a you know, close ally and, uh, of, of, of Russia. Um, so I think that really depends on the broader relationship between the United States and Russia. If the United States and Russia have a sort of, you know, a, a more productive relationship where the tensions are under control, then the, the concern is a lot less. But the arms buildup in, in Venezuela is, and there's a, a lot, I mean, there are there are good security uh, specialists that have very good information on this, and I can send it to you. You know, of, of you know, the, it's it's very very significant, and I think the the cons the people that are most sensitive about it and are watching it more closely are the Colombians. At the same time that they have this rapprochement uh, diplomatically with Venezuela, uh, they see that they're, you know, that Chavez is buying arms for, and Russia is the main supplier. And, um, you know, uh, so that I think is something of much, much greater concern uh, to the Colombians than anybody else at this point. Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Um, uh, I wanted to know what you think about um, the, I guess you mentioned earlier that obviously relations between Venezuela and the United States are minimal. Um, and I wonder how you think that will play out in the in the you know upcoming years, um, the next five years, as far as uh, the oil issue, especially with um, growing you know you know the growing oil industry as far well I think Colombia would be a better example than Brazil. Um, and how do you think that will affect the way that Chavez? If, I mean, if at all, the way that he actually, that the, the industry is being handled right now, or maybe that, if that would maybe make him a little more, for lack of a better word, scared, cautious as far as how he um, deals with the United States, or do you think that the United States will become increasingly, increasingly more indifferent to his policies and threat because they will have a potential um, maybe not entirely a replacement to what they buy, what they currently get from Venezuela, but more than before. I think that they have a more, I think the U.S. is less concerned because of Chavez's weakness and because also because of what you talk about, alternative to oil. I mean, now Colombia is the fourth largest, uh, you know, oil producer uh, in Latin America after Venezuela, Brazil, and, and Mexico. Uh, Brazil now is, you know, more, um, so the oil dependence has gone down uh, a lot. I th but at the same time, there is nervousness about, you know, Chavez being weak and Chavez finding himself in kind of a difficult position of what, you know, he's unpredictable. 
And uh, that I think is, that, so that is kind of the attitude. I think it's less worried about the dependence on, on oil um, and more worried about kind of what happens when somebody feels that, you know, that if they're weak and, 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 and things are kind of not going their way and what, 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 are, what are his options. And, you know, and there I think, you know, they're watching carefully and that's why the arms build up and other things are kinds of, you know, and, and Venezuela is a very, very highly polarized <coughs> country. Uh, and he also has uh, supported militias that are uh, parallel to the armed forces uh, that are armed. Uh, a lot of the opposition is armed because they're, they're nervous about, about the government. And so you have a polarized armed country and uh, that has, I think, you know, potential consequences. I'm sh I have no doubt that the Brazilians uh, uh, are Brazilian military and others are, watch are also you know, watching it very closely to see what happens. Uh, so I'm not sort of predicting any kind of violent scenario, but one can't, you know, rule that out. But I think, it's, I think that the, the, the oil question, I think the United States is seeing that as there are other options you know, to, 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 and that Venezuela is in a very difficult position. Venezuela has tried, from Chavez came in, he talked about shifting the market from the United States to China. And it's very, very difficult. You just have to look at a map uh, and you can see that this, the tremendous, you know, the cost problems and all the refineries are here in the United States and everything is all set up for Venezuelan oil. And it's just, it's just, and, and the, the, the amount of oil that he exports to China is minimal, despite, I think, his, his real desire to do that. But it's just very, very hard for financial and technical, technological reasons. So he's in a, you know, he's in a difficult position. And the, and the PDVSA, the state oil company, has, if you look at the figures, have gone down a lot in their production. So they're, they're in real trouble. But as far as the United States, Venezuela being the third largest I think that's correct, right? That if there's a third Close to third to four, fourth. Yeah. Um, you don't see that, you know, as, as far as just the huge amount of, of decline in production or anything, you don't see that as being a, a, a huge, I mean, a, 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 an increasing concern on, in the part of the United States? No, I think the United States thinks that it, there are other, there are other uh, real potential sources so that that could replace the Venezuela. That's declining, but it's growing in Colombia, and it's growing, and that Brazil is now exploring, and, and that, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't hear people commenting in Washington, you know, what are we going to do to replace, you know, we don't, we're not going to get that oil from Venezuela, uh, because I think it's, that's, that's not the concern that I, that I sense. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask you about this common trend in the region of the distancing with respect to the United States, and I wanted to ask you if you think it's on, if it's more, like regionally speaking, of an ideological position and an end in itself, or if, it, or if it's perceived as some sort of a, like an instrumental pathway towards more social equality that's not dependent on capitalism or what have you. And in that sense, and I ask you this because I think that if it is um, an end in itself and it's ideologically motivated, then it should be kind of a permanent distancing. And if it's only considered a mean, towards something else, then it should be just a temporal situation that should be reversed later. I just wanted to I mean, ask you what you thought. Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. And I ask myself the same question uh, a lot. And, and you, you framed it better than I do. But, uh, but you know, I th you know, the question is whether this is reversible or not reversible, because it clearly is, is, is happening. Uh, and I, I don't, I, you know, my, my, in, my instinct is that it's very, it could be very, very hard to, you know, to, to, go, to go back to any kind of, you know, not, not that we should go back. I'm not, I don't think that was, that was the place to be. But I, I think it's, uh, uh, I don't know if it's ideological is the right word, but it's structural maybe. It's, you know, it's just instead of instrumental, I mean, I just think it's a sort of a, it's, it's, it's the global, you know, the effect of globalization uh, and the increasingly important global role that Latin America is playing. And I don't see that changing. 
I think it's becoming more, not less. And that means, you know, that was the distancing from the United States. I mean, the agenda <coughs> used to be the United States, Latin America. You know, you talk about issues on U.S. Latin American relations. You talk about immigration, you talk about drugs, dra trade, those are issues. I mean, now it's, you know, it's uh, talk about Iran, talk about Iraq, talk about Libya, talk about uh, global governance, international financial institutions, uh, climate change, uh, you know. Uh, and Latin Americans are, you know, and a lot of countries are, are at the table, and I think they're going to stay there and play an important, and so that shifts the, the nature of the relationship. It's not a, uh, it's not an anti-American attitude, it's, it's simply, you know, the, the, you know, it's sort of a structural change and a, and, a, and, a, and, uh, and, and that the, and that the agenda is, is, you know, is a global one. And this kind of this sort of uh, exhaustion and frustration with you know, and also a sense, frankly, it's also related, I think, very much to the dysfunction of the U.S. political system, because those issues that I just named, if any, if they're going to become unstuck on immigration, uh, drugs trade, they have to be a, a political system in Washington that functions a little more effectively. And uh, I, I think Latin Americans, most of them see that that's unlikely to happen. Um, and so it's the combination of those opportunities in global fora and dealing with global issues combined with the recognition that the, the sort of the traditional agenda is, is, is kind of frozen and fixed and it's not going to happen. Now, you know, if all of a sudden, you know, Washington becomes much more functional and we start, we have, you know, comprehensive immigration reform and, and there's, you know, there's a sort of a new initiative on rethinking drug policy and, and doing all these things, you know, maybe, uh, you know, that would change. But it's, I, I think it's, it's, that, it's that combination which uh, my sense is that it's more structural than instrumental. But, but I think that's exactly the right question, and, and that's, I think that's, you know, you put it well. Yes? I would like to hear your comments towards um, deepening our democratic regimes. You were mentioning that many of the administrations in this country don't seem to be very inclined towards democratic institutions and building and respect them. At the same time, whatever is cost and whatever is effect, the opposition is quite weak in many of these countries, not all these countries, in some other countries in Latin America as well. Um, how do you see this developing over time? I, I'm quite concerned about, I'm not going to say that we didn't make any progress in the 80s, but it's not that we were making all that much progress in some countries. And the press is also concerned in, in, in many countries with uh, a lot of censorship or right. you know, I think it's you know I think it's a complicated mixed picture. I mean, um, there are aspects about the press that I think one has to sort of recognize that it's playing a very important role in a lot of countries and, and you know shining a light on corruption and and you know and one could go to Brazil and Colombia and a lot of other places where I mean this is this is that's a central function. Of democracy and accountability, and and that's very very important. And there are other cases where I think you know there are people that argue other countries have have deepened democracy and consolidated democracy. And there are some aspects that I think you know get better, and some aspects that that don't. I think elections. One has, still has to stand back and say that you know elections are pretty much you know happening regularly, uh, that's true. That's true. and that that has to be recognized. No, no. I think the expectations were, uh, but maybe the expectations were, un, you know, were uh, unrealistic or inflated or inflated about what what could happen. Uh, I think the one area where that hasn't uh, is, the, you know, the ju you know the judiciary and justice system. I think there, at least a lot of the uh, analyses that I've read by, sort of, you know, jurists and legal scholars are just there was, you know, judicial reform is very very 
difficult and people are, are, it's very, very slow. And there have been some innovations, institutional innovations in, in uh, sort of ombudsmen and, and, and something like that. But I think that there I thought that this sort of the, sort of the rule of law and justice system would, uh, you know, would, would, would progress uh, a lot more and that just hasn't happened. And, and I think it's that the, the difficulty and the resistance uh, to those kind and obstacles to those kinds of reforms are very, very deep. And it's just, you know, and you can't do everything at once and so you try to get the economy stabilized and you try to hold elections and, and then to reform the justice system is, is, is very tough. So, and some, you know, and political parties, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, it's mixed depending on which, you know, country. Uh, I mean, the interesting, one of the interesting countries now that uh, people are looking at is Chile, of course, you know, because here, there you have a country where um, traditionally you had strong political parties and, and still probably relative to other countries you do, but clearly there's a lot of protests and a lot of discontent um, and a sense that uh, a president who's tremendously unpopular and an opposition that's even more unpopular and, um, and yet, a, you know, a country that still by all, if you look at all the, the data on Chile, this, you know, they're still performing very well. The economy's doing very well. And so, you, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's the sense that, um, you know, politics is important in the sense that these, this, there's a lack of representation uh, that people feel kind of left out. And uh, you had this concertacion that was in, that was in, you know, power for 20 years, and uh, they all, uh, you know, they all uh, didn't want to go back to the Pinochet dictatorship or the chaos of the Allende years, and so they were very cautious and very careful and didn't move very forward. I mean, Chile is still operates under the constitution of the Pinochet, the 1980 constitution of Pinochet. And so now you have a new generation that says, you know, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, they, they were, they weren't, they weren't there under Pinochet. They were born after Pinochet, and they're saying, you know, why, why are we still operating under this constitution of this dictator, and why are we, you know, and you, and, and the old, the old, the, the traditional political parties didn't push. And so now they're pushing, uh, despite the fact, and they're pushing for more access to education, higher quality education, and, and more inclusion politically, uh, more open political parties, and all of that, in a country that has been you know, regarded as one of the best performers uh, and a model in some ways, uh, in, terms, in terms of its economy and even in terms of social policy. So it's, it's sort of a, it illustrates, I think, part of what's happening uh, in a number of different different countries uh, in the region. Yes. When you were here eight years ago, the predominant issue with Colombia was the internal security situ situation, especially with regarding drugs. Has Colombia exported its drug problem, if you will, to another country, specifically Mexico? Have the the diminished power, or what seemed to be the diminished power and resources that the, the FARC and other groups that were trafficking in drugs in Colombia, has that now moved closer to our own border into Mexico? What's your position on that? Well, I don't know about exporting. I mean, I think it's clear that, you know, I mean, what we've seen on the drug issue, I think this is pretty there's almost a consensus on this is that there's you know success in one place you know it pops up somewhere else and unless you deal with it in a sort of a uh, sort of a, a, a global sort of uh, you know uh, context it's very very hard to address I think I, I don't think I don't, I don't think this the explanation for why Mexico is necessarily you know the Colombia is the is the only factor, and there are a lot of different factors that explain it. But I think, you know, I think that the, that the that there are, you know, that the drugs find, you know, different different trafficking routes and different ways that they, you know, the drug traffickers, you know, exploit the situation. And so um, I do think that unless it's tackled, you know. Um, in a sort of a holistic, integral way, it's just going to be—it's going to move from one place to another, and that is, 
you know, I mean, I, I, you know, there are some people that argue on the drug, the drug issue, you know, that you should, that drug policy should be designed so that it goes, to, you know, that it goes to the, to the country that's best able to deal with it with strong institutions, and so we should sort of deliberately almost sort of, sort of, that should go in that, in that direction. Um, also, the other thing I would say in response to the question is that Colombia still has a, you know, still the drug problem is, hasn't uh, disappeared from Colombia. Uh, you don't have the Medellin and the, and the uh, you know, the Cali cartels, but uh, uh, the drug problem is there and the security problem is there and uh, you have sort of criminal bands that are, that are involved in the drug trade and so um, this is, you know, this, this is still, you know, a serious problem. Uh, and I should say that the Colombians are, there's a very, uh, I'm sure that uh, General Consul knows that, that there's a lot of collaboration and cooperation now with Colombia and Mexico. Uh, because, Me because Colombia did have a lot of experience uh, dealing with this issue. Um, so I, th I think it's, I think it's, I think, you know, you, you've touched on something that's sort of, you know, the, it's a factor in this that explains Mexico, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's Mexico, I think, has to be, is more complicated than that, and it's a broader, broader explanation. Um, and I think the drug issue is, you know, is to different degrees, if you look at Central America today as well. I mean, now the argument is that Guatemala uh, and El Salvador and, uh, and Honduras, their security situation is getting worse, their drug situation is worse because of the success, so-called success of the Calderon policy in Mexico, uh, that the setas and others are going south. And so into countries that are much more vulnerable and have much less capacity to deal with those problems. So, you know, the Mexico problem is being displaced to Central, Central America. And so this, you know, there's a lot of that you know, going on. It's a very, it's a very fluid situation. Well, um, I'm afraid we have to finish because we have a small reception if you want to join us and you can speak uh, directly to our guest. But I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we think you we have a grand principio. Continuous. Gracias. Gracias.